Hi everyone, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and I'm here in Chicago at the American Heart Association meeting, and I'm pleased to be with my colleague, uh, Dr. Jason Andrade from the University of British Columbia, who uh, presented a late-breaking clinical trial today called Progressive AF that was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but that's not why I'm intimidated by Jason. I'm intimidated by Jason because he has an amazing power output on a bike, and I know this because I follow him on Zwift. So Jason, welcome. Thank you, John. It's always a pleasure to see you. Tell us about the, uh, tell us about the trial you presented today and, uh, and how it ended up. Yeah, so the trial we presented today, we took 303 patients with treatment-naive atrial fibrillation, uh, randomized them to first treatment with antiarrhythmic drugs or first treatment with ablation. And the key result that we saw was a 75% lower progression to persistent AFib after ablation relative to drugs. So this uh, trial was sort of a continuation of the early AFib. Tell us about how that separated out. Yeah, so um, early AF is kind of your standard endpoint that we had uh, in each of sort of the six first line trials. So you're looking at 30 seconds of AFib on a loop recorder or recorder. Um, you know, you could argue how meaningful is that endpoint. So early AF really was in line with HRS recommended uh, follow-up duration and endpoint, sort of ended at a year. And progressive AF was kind of that second phase. So instead of looking at binary recurrence, now we're looking at whether or not we're actually modifying the disease. And that's our three-year follow-up study. And I'm going to ask you about the patients, but first tell me why progression of AFib or, or progression to persistent AFib is so important. Yeah, so the idea that, you know, AF is a progressive disease. It starts with an isolated electrical problem. Uh, every episode of AFib leads to more electrical and structural changes. Eventually, with time, that will induce uh, abnormalities in the heart that cause the atrial fibrillation episodes to last longer. We know when you get to persistent AFib that the rates of stroke are higher, the mortality is higher, new onset heart failure is higher. And so if we're you know, walking this back to a treatment-naive population, if I have a therapy that I can provide, whatever that is, that can halt that progression, maybe we're then going to see that long-term benefit, especially when we apply it to, you know, 40-year-olds instead of 70-year-olds. Yeah, so that's a lead-in to the patients. The, the, this patient population was kind of a young, fairly healthy population, but yet you still could show reduction of progression of AFib. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that's exactly what we were targeting, right? So we, most of the ablation studies are done in 60, 70-year-olds who have lots of comorbidities. Uh, you know, those comorbidities lead to structural changes to begin with. Uh, for our study, we really want to get at the crux of the issue. If it's an electrical problem that is potentially fixable with an ablation, are we going to realize that benefit long term in terms of halting the progression? Now, I mean, it's pretty well known that ablation is better than drugs. But one of the things that I liked about your trial is that you really pushed on the drug arm to make sure that patients got adequate drug therapy and and didn't and and failed drug therapy. Yeah. So uh, you know, before the, uh, failed drug therapy before they've crossed over. Yeah. I, I mean, anticipating what the criticism is going to be, you always want to know that your control arm or whatever your comparator is is as well treated as it can be. Right. So if I you know did this study and the antiarrhythmic drug arm were all under treated, then the results are. Uh, not important anymore because you kind of handicap the trial. So, you know, we did have aggressive titration protocols. Uh, all those were available at the supplement, so you can use them in your own practice. Uh, our goal was 90 days to get those patients as stable as you can get them, suppress all their AFib on a loop recorder. And only after that 90 days did we start counting outcomes. And uh, tell us the role of the, the loop recorder and why that's so important. Uh, so in this trial, the reason we had the loop recorder is it's truth, right? So, you know, if you're not monitoring atrial fibrillation all the time, you run the risk of introducing error where you're just not seeing the episodes and you may, you know, make a, a false conclusion based on what you're seeing. Uh, and having the loop recorders, you know, we're monitoring every minute of every day for all of those patients out to three years now in this most recent study. And so we can definitively say, looking at burden, looking at, you know, the timing of the episodes, that there is truly a difference. Yeah. And, and um, one of the things I want to push you on a little bit is, okay, there's this big relative risk reduction, 75% risk reduction. But I was struck by early AFib, and I'm struck by this, that the actual AF burden in these patients is pretty low in, in absolute terms. What do you say to that? Um, so the first thought is, 
uh, it's hard to know what it means in absolute terms because these are the first studies that ever looked at it, right? So, you know, if we look at early AF, uh, if we look at circa dose even, um, you know, the criticisms on those trials are you're looking at AF burdens of 1%. And what does that mean? Um, you know, if you look at the patients and the ways that we normally judge them, they're highly symptomatic. They're going to the emergency room to get cardioverted. They're having multiple episodes a month. So in every sort of subjective descriptor that they're providing, they're highly symptomatic. But when you monitor this paroxysmal AF population, they have very low burdens of disease. Um, you know, in early AF, when we published it, the mean difference between the groups was 3%. And so what does 3% mean? It sounds like a low number, but that's one day less AF per month in a 30-day month, right? So it, it's a little bit of context. Okay. And then uh, another question I wanted to ask you, I, I, how do you think that the cryo-balloon ablation results that you find translate to uh, RF ablation and other means of ablation? Uh, you might even say something about the upcoming PFA uh, energy source. Yeah. Um, you know, it, before early AF and stop AF first and cryo first, there were three RF studies, so RAFT and naturopath. Uh, they didn't show the same significant benefit with first line ablation. Uh, those were all point by point RF. And one of the reasons for initiating early AF back in the beginning was that you have a technology that is theoretically more reproducible. And so in the hands of 18 centers in Canada, we can anticipate that the results are going to be very consistent. Whereas in something like Circadose, where the overall uh, RF um, cryo balloon results were similar, we actually saw a whole lot of variability in the RF group. So some RF ablators who are highly experienced will outperform cryo. The average RF ablator is going to be about as good as cryo, but then half the population are actually worse. And I think that that speaks a little bit to the generalizability question of these results. Yeah, and in fire and ice, uh, uh, they were equivalent, but of course, uh, Carl Heinz Cook said that these RF ablators were born to ablate, and so they might not be translatable to the average uh, ablation person. Yeah, and that's sort of the same question, right? Yeah. I mean, in Canada, I think we have a lower number of centers, so our, our expertise is a bit more concentrated. That being said, we still saw in Circadose a lot of variability in the RF groups. One of the things that I'm concerned about is the overuse of AFib ablation, especially in, uh, uh, you know, sort of different health, non-cost constrained health systems like the US. How would you translate these results to, to regular clinical, clinical practice? How do you, how, how long do you wait or how much do you push on risk factor modification or drug therapy before going to early ablation? Yeah, I mean, that's always a, a good question. I mean, one of the things that we outlined in the paper uh, just, you know, before we hit our limitations piece is that this is just one piece of the puzzle, right? This is not the be all and the end all. Ablation is not an absolute solution. Uh, it's part of the treatment pathway. We still have to focus on stroke prevention. And equally important is risk factor modification. You have to do them all in concert. You can't just do one. Um, you know, I think that when you have a reproducible uh, technology and you have experienced operators who can get a very reproducible result, then I think these results are generalizable. Uh, turning it to other technologies which are more user dependent, where there's a lot more variability and experience, I don't know that you're necessarily going to see the same result. And so I think this is where shared decision making becomes a big piece of it. But we can't forget that we have to be aggressive with risk factor modification and the other pillars of the AF management. So if you had, say, a 60-year-old person came in with risk factors in their first episode of AFib and it was symptomatic, what, what, would, you, what would you do? So for me, this is not a trial of first episode of AFib. This is a trial of people who have AFib that has gotten to the point where you now need to intervene, right? So early F enrolled people a median of one year after diagnosis. Uh, to me, that first episode of AFib or the AFib alert on your Apple Watch that's kind of a, a red flag to say, we need to do something to improve your chances overall. And that's your signal to say risk factor modification, getting everything under control so that you don't get to the point where we need to intervene on your AFib. Uh, you know, this trial is really that later point of when we need to intervene. Jason, thank you so much for saying that. And, and I'm going to close with that because I want that to be the, the, the final word. Thank you for being here. Anytime.